Welcome. My name is Sue Acton, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Gross Point. And I am very happy to welcome you to our October program, a primer on polling. We have an election coming up on Tuesday, November 8th. League members in Gross Point and Harper Woods are well aware of this as we have been building toward it all year with petition drives, candidate forums, and Vote 411 information gathering. We had a get out the vote postcard drive. We helped stuff absentee ballots and distributed 4,500 voter guides. We created a speakers bureau on election topics and signed up to be election workers. And all year, we have presented programs to help our members and the public better understand the issues important to our community. And we can't wait to see how our efforts have paid off. We know, we'll know the answers soon enough after November 8th, but we are anxious. We want to know now. So we read the polls, we find polling podcasts, news videos. Some of us even participate in polls. Are we winning yet? Should we make more phone calls, send more postcards, knock on more do doors? When can we coast? So yes, polls are important to us. But what should we know from the experts on polling? To find out, tonight I would like to introduce Joan Richardson, our Vice President for Programs to introduce our very special guest. Very good, thank you, Sue. Probably don't have to remind anybody that we're just 13 days away from the election. By the morning after, we should have a pretty good idea about how all of those races turned out. But until we have results in hand, as Sue noted, we rely on pre-election polls to give us, give us a sense of what's going on out there in election land. Polling is almost as old as America itself. The first instance of what we now call an opinion poll was in 1824, when a newspaper in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania asked voters who they intended to support for president that year. The candidates were Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. Before long, other newspapers got into the act, but their polls weren't very scientific, so the accuracy varied widely. Many times newspapers were printing coupons or forms that they invited readers to complete and mail back. Well, you can imagine what kind of results they got from that. And eventually some newspapers trained interviewers on how to gather information in more precise ways. The dawn of the more scientific polling came almost a hundred years ago when George Gallup devised a system that used a randomly selected statistically average sample of adults. That was in 1932. The process has gotten more sophisticated since then, and as the media has expanded over the decades, the reporting about polling has also expanded. If you're paying attention to elections and campaigns, it's hard to overlook those polls. Our goal tonight is to learn a bit more about how polls really work and how we can become more savvy consumers about the information they provide. We'll also learn a bit about how they do or don't shape the results on election day. And to help us tonight, we have the opportunity to learn from two really outstanding journalists. The first is Gary Langer. Gary is an internationally recognized public opinion researcher with expertise in analysis of political, policy, economic, and social attitudes, questionnaire design, and survey methodology and management. His company, Langer Research Associates in New York City, produces the ABC News Washington Post poll for ABC News. He manages international surveys for the Pew Research Center and designs, manages, and analyzes surveys for a range of other media, foundation, association, and business clients. Gary has personally overseen and analyzed literally hundreds of surveys on a broad range of topics. He was director of polling at ABC News for 20 years, and before that, a newsman for the Associated Press for 10 years. He covered the 1984 and 1988 presidential elections and directed AP polls during that period. His work has been recognized with two News Emmy Awards, the first and only Emmys to cite public opinion polls. <laughs> 
Closer to home, Tim Kiska is a veteran Detroit journalist. He went to work at the Detroit Free Press while he was still a student at Wayne State University, and he worked there and at the Detroit News for the next 30 years. As a reporter, Tim has done it all. He's written feature articles, covered the courts, covered radio and television. He even wrote a gossip column for a while. And he learned to make election night projections when the field was in its infancy and was put in charge of free press indicator precinct operations. He has effectively been the decision desk for election night coverage at the free press and WXYZ TV for dozens of years. Along the way, Tim managed to earn a PhD in history from Wayne State and eventually moved from the newsroom to academic life. He's currently a professor of communications at the University of Michigan Dearborn. And he's won a lot of awards, but one of my favorites is that he was recently elected to the Michigan Journalism Hall of Fame. So in the interest of full disclosure, I've worked with both of these gentlemen at different points in my career, <clears throat> which really means that I can vouch for the quality of their work, and most importantly, the integrity with which they do that work. So as a reminder, if you have questions during the evening, drop those into the chat box. We'll monitor those and add those to the conversation as appropriate. And for right now, we're gonna get started with Gary Langer. Thanks a lot, Joan. Thank you all for joining. I'm really honored and pleased to be here tonight with Tim and especially with Joan, an old friend and colleague. I have to say, uh, um, you're really fortunate to have her involved in your organization. And I'm pleased to spend the time with you tonight. You know, it's Joan mentioned. I was I'm a I'm a recovering journalist, and and uh, uh, that work is not that distant from what we do now in public opinion research. Some people ask me why did I change professions when I went from the Associated Press, where I was an ink stained wretch, to uh, uh, the ABC News polling unit, and the answer is I didn't. The process is very much the same. We go to our best sources, ask our best questions, write down what they tell us, and report what we found out. The difference, the main difference, I think, is that in survey research, we have to use a random sample of sources. We can't uh, pick and choose selectively. Uh, that takes us, I think, to the slides. So let me do a screen share, bring these slides up, and let's start this presentation. It's a quick one, and uh, I'll try to make it enjoyable for you. OK. Um, the best way to get people not to listen to you is to say I'm going to talk about survey methodology. So I'll try to do it in a really quick and entertaining way. The pollsters have a, a line we like to use, which is that if you don't believe in random sampling, then the next time your doctor wants to do a blood test, have him take it all. The idea being that a small amount of blood randomly drawn from all the blood in your body is adequate to test for, you name it, red count, white count, cholesterol, we could go on. The principle is you have to have an adequate sample and the blood has to be randomly drawn. Another example is uh, the, the, the pot of soup. That's minestrone out there. Say you got a pot of soup sticking on your stove, sitting on your stove when you want to know what's in the soup. Well, you might approach it with an eyedropper, take a little bit of the soup out and look, what do you got? Tomato broth. It's really not telling you what's in the soup. You might try it with a teaspoon. It's still inadequate. What you need is a soup ladle, an adequate sample of the soup. That's the first thing you got to do. The second thing you got to do is stir the pot, randomize the contents of the pot. And if you do that and dip your ladle in, you'll get a good representation of what's in the entire pot. What's interesting here is that the sample uh, is informative, unrelated to the size of the universe from which it's drawn. The pot can be a large pot on your, on your stove. It can be a pot the size of your stove, the size of your kitchen, the size of your home the size of the uh, University of Michigan football stadium, the size of the planet Pluto. As long as the contents are randomized, that same dipper uh, will tell you what's in the soup. This is how random sampling works. A lot of surveys these days are done by methods other than random sampling. I'll talk a little about that down the road, uh, but they uh, depart from the principles of inferential statistics, which tell us that we need a random sample to make inferences about a full set from which it's drawn. Okay, that's it for sampling, it was easy. Second point is that forecasting is not easy. Uh, this uh, recently reported uh, just, I think week before last by the uh, Washington Post, 48 hours before Hurricane Ian made landfall in Fort Myers on September 28th, the American model projected it would make landfall in Tampa on September 29th. I'm not bringing this up to throw shade at the folks at NOAA, they do an amazing job. 
but predictions are really complex and difficult. There's a lot of variables that come into play, and that's the case with uh, hurricanes, and it's the case with election polling as well. Moreover, in pre-election polls, forecasting, I would like to suggest, isn't the point. Think of all the things we find out from polls uh, done before an election. What issues motivate likely voters? What don't uh, move them? What policy preferences do they hold? What candidate attributes matter or don't matter to them? How do campaign controversies influence the contest, if at all? How and why are these voters coming to their choices, whether to participate, to vote, and if so, whom to support? In short, what does this election mean? These are all things that absent good quality, independent public opinion research, we would not know about the election, as opposed to the one thing that we will know in the fullness of time without polls, which is who wins, right? So while we demand to try to know the future before it happens with all those challenges, we need to keep in mind the fundamental purpose of the enterprise is to learn more than that which we will already know in the fullness of time. And then point four, remember the cone of uncertainty. Any other poll, and polls surround us, survey research is everywhere. Uh, you probably hear once a month about the unemployment rate. Yeah, you ever wonder where they get that? Well, the Census Bureau does a survey, 30,000 people for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they ask you who's working. It's a survey. And there are many up and down, all sorts of surveys that surround us. These polls, most polls, sample a known population. Pre-election polls must estimate and sample an unknown population people who are going to vote. It used to be that this just happened on election day. Now there's this long period, <clears throat> excuse me, of early and absentee voting, but the same uncertainties exist. We don't know who the population is and we'd have to estimate it. That need for estimation produces additional uncertainty. And the uncertainty is exacerbated by a various range of externalities, holding elections in a pandemic, holding elections in the midst of a fundamental change in how people vote, the rise of early and absentee voting, holding an election at a time of extraordinary political emotion, uh, as we find ourselves in. All these can influence the, the estimates and the best efforts of pollsters to figure out who to sample before they even go and sample. Next point, and an important one, is not all polls are, are created equal. There's a challenge of probability sampling, that's random sampling, as I just described it, versus convenience sampling. Many, many polls these days are done by uh, convenience sampling, chiefly opt-in online panels. These are surveys that are produced, uh, uh, produced among people who've signed themselves up to click through questionnaires on the internet in exchange for cash and gifts. And a, a long uh, string now of independent academic research has found these uh, uh, surveys to be highly problematic uh, in terms of the the reliability of their estimates, both within a given panel over time and across panels within a given point in time. Uh, we're surrounded by uh, subpar methods of survey research, and we need to make and recognize the difference. It's not just numbers and percentage signs. Beyond sampling, there are good versus poor practices in, 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 in questionnaire design, the forgotten stepchild of survey research, in data weighting and in data analysis, the cure for all this is transparency, which we have to insist on. If, you know, survey research polls, while they are maybe off-putting because you weren't personally uh, included, are compelling. It's like a look in the mirror. You really, uh, reporters, the rest of us, want to know, as I think Joan said in her intro, what's going on, and polls tell us that. But we therefore see numbers, we grab them, we got to have them, and we run with them. I like to say that running with with polls is like running with scissors. It's easy to get hurt. Stop and sort out where these numbers and percentage signs came from. Reporters should be doing this. They don't do a terribly good job at it. News organizations need standards, but we ourselves as news consumers need to stop and say, what's the methodology here? Uh, it, a detailed description of a survey methodology should be included with any survey. Every question that was asked in the survey and the overall results to that survey should be included. And if you have those, then you can see, is the sampling okay? Are the questions okay? Are they leading or biased? Is the analysis fair and true to the data or is it cherry picked? We can only find these things out when we have transparency. The key point about this point is that reporting polls, 
requires reporting by reporters and news organizations need to be encouraged to do more reporting, not to just stick numbers into their stories. Most news organizations lack polling standards. We need to encourage them to adopt them. And because of that condition, it's up to us individually to become educated data consumers. And I encourage you to move in that direction. A lot of good sources online. Now, I've said, this is just a quick slide. I know there's a lot of numbers here. I, I presented all the challenges and certainly you've heard about the challenges of final pre-election horse race estimates, who's gonna win the election. We know what makes though for good estimates. These are final pre-election estimates in polls I've done and my predecessors at ABC News have done. Uh, going back, as you can see, quite a long way. Uh, and uh, we didn't do a national uh, presidential vote estimate in 2020, but in previous years going back, they've all been quite accurate and there's been no growth or change in their accuracy. How come? We use really rigorous methods, we use large sample size, and we poll very close to election day. Uh, a, a lot of organizations don't have the luxury of time or the expense budget to mount these sorts of efforts, and they get into trouble as a result. Okay, final point is that for all of its challenges, pre-election polling, like forecasting hurricanes, provides essential, if sometimes imprecise, information. Campaigns and interest groups themselves conduct polls to try to manipulate public attitudes and behavior and manipulate media coverage of issues and candidates in order to achieve their goals. The absence of good quality, independent public interest polling would leave us defenseless to this manipulation. Thanks very much for listening. Wow, there's a lot of information there. Um... So I'm going to jump in and just ask some additional questions here. Um, you know, one thing that I don't think a lot of people know, and I honestly can't answer this question myself, is how do pollsters decide who's going to be called and included in a poll? So yeah, where so, does that start? Yep. Yeah, so the, the again, the fundamental principle, as the, dictated by the inferential statistics, you I mean you a random subset drawn from a full set to make inferences about it. There's a few ways to do this. So we run surveys for the Pew Research Center around the world, many of which in developing countries are still conducted face-to-face, -face, area probability random sampling. In the United States, we still do telephone surveys. They're actually quite, uh, still quite accurate. That's a random sample of phone numbers, such as when we make the first call, let's say for an ABC News Washington Post poll, every residential telephone cell or landline in the country has pretty much the same probability of ringing, All right? It's a truly random sample. It could be Dawn who's on this call or Joan or Marge or Mary or Tim or the guy who pounds your fender, the lady across the lunch counter, your Paris priest, your local bookie, everybody's in. And that's why it works. They don't select themselves to be in, they're randomly selected. Now there's another method that's used these days. This is probability-based, random sample-based, and also therefore effective. And these are probability-based rather than uh, opt-in online panels. These are panels in which people are invited through uh, address-based sampling. Just about everybody in the country, 98%, 99% have a, a postal address and we can get the list from the postal service. You randomly invite people to to come to your online panel. If they don't have online access, you give it to them. Now you've got a randomly assembled panel that you can give people questionnaires to complete. And there are good results of these surveys and they've stood up well to academic scrutiny. The piece that doesn't work is self-selection as in all these very many opt-in panels or convenience samples. So when your interviewers are going out to make a phone call, are they calling to reach somebody at a specific number or are they calling to reach a specific person? So, so are they calling to get me, Joan Richardson, particularly? No, we, we don't know who's at the, at the other end of the number. What we okay. do for a telephone survey, for example, we know every working area code, we know every working exchange, and we know every working block, which is the last four numbers in the phone number. Mm -hmm. So we can randomly create uh, every possible working phone number in the country. And then we select from that list and we dial it. We don't know who we're dialing. If we're dialing cell phones, then those are personal instruments. And we'll ask to interview whoever picks up the line after confirming that, that they're over 18 and it's their phone. When we call households, we have to randomly select within the household because if you don't, you, mom answers. 
And so you call the household, uh, will ask to speak. There's a variety of ways of doing it. For example, the, the uh, person who had the most recent birthday is a very common approach because it's a random phenomenon. Interesting. So um, why the telephone? I mean, why do you still use the telephone when you have the internet available? And the internet is generally accessible to, I forget what percentage of houses in the country. So why are phones still the preferred method? Well, I don't know that phones are the preferred method these days. We do, uh, again, it depends on the circumstances. In the United States, we do in our shop uh, telephone interviewing, and we also do these probability panel uh, mm -hmm. surveys, probably more of the probability panel surveys. Those take a little longer to complete, and they can have panel effects because these are people who have agreed to sign up and to take a survey every couple of weeks. They don't overdo it. Uh, so you're a member of a panel that couldn't slightly change you where there's less commitment in responding to a telephone survey. We just call up and say, hey, we're doing a survey for ABC News and Washington Post. We, we, can we ask you a few questions? Right. It's not a long term commitment. So in some ways, it's preferred. It's increasingly hard these days. People have uh, 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 call blockers on their uh, cell phones in particular, and it's harder to get through to people. Uh, Non-response is an issue, people not participating, but it's only an issue in if it's systematic, N random non-response doesn't affect the integrity of the sample. If we did surveys and only Republicans spoke with us and Democrats en masse said, I'm not participating, that would be biased if it was a political survey. Mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, need to ensure and assure ourselves that our samples indeed are representative. And we do that by comparing our results, first, what we get over time to see that it's consistent, and then be against census norms for age, race, sex, education, income, whatever we have data from that we can compare to known values and ensure that we're accurate. And we're always going to be a little bit off. Young people, for example, are really hard to get to participate. And surveys are trued up through waiting. It's usually a very small effect and should be, but just to, to, to true up the wheel and make sure you're fully appropriately representing each population group that you can. So, so explain waiting more, because I think that's a concept that most people will not be familiar with. Sure. So um, say I do a survey <clears throat> uh, and I know that it's a national general population survey, about 52% of adults in this country are women, 48% are men. I might do my survey and find that I got 54% women, 55% women, because of the vagaries of sampling. Don't forget, this isn't laser surgery on your eyeball, right? It's an estimate. Mm -hmm. So I've got more women than are truly reflected in the population. So I'll take the data and I'll slightly weight down the women. Every woman will, rather than being a one in terms of their value in the sample, might be a 0.89 or a 0.86 and the men will be slightly weighted up till I get the correct proportion of men and women according to the census. It, it should be a minor effect, uh, but it trues it up and increases the accuracy. Some surveys went wrong back in, in, um, in, in 2016, uh, some state level surveys, uh, there was an investigation by our professional association and it found that they weren't really waiting, either weren't waiting at all or weren't appropriately waiting uh, by education. And therefore, they were under they were understating education groups that were important to the outcome of the election. So it's important to chew up the sample as best you can. And people who are less socially engaged are less likely to participate. Low, less educated people, lower income people, uh, some in some cases minorities, and certainly young people. So we do like to chew them up through waiting. So when you're doing a national survey, your goal is to have, what is it, about 1,100 people in a, a national survey? Yeah, it's interesting. It's actually, you hear so much about a third survey of 1,000 people, right? It's like, it seems the norm. And why is why 1,000? Is it because three zeros look good? Actually, the reason is you tend to want to sample for the size of the smallest subgroup that you want to reliably analyze. And we see in, in random sample data that when you have about 100 cases, the data really stabilized. On the way to 100, you get a lot of movement, but when you get, it it decreases and decreases. And once you get to 100 cases, it really stabilizes and stays pretty stable on up from there. So we say, okay, I want 100 cases plus or minus in the smallest subgroups I want to analyze. When we do a national sample of 1,000 adults, we get about 100 black adults and we get about 115 or 120 Hispanic adults, two groups that we want to analyze. So the size of our overall sample of 1,000 is driven by your desire to adequately represent those two samples for analytical purposes.
Okay. So if you were doing a statewide survey, say in Michigan, for example, how many people would you need to have to do a decent, uh, trustworthy survey in Michigan? Well, in and of itself. So it, it really, it depends on what I want to do with it, how hard I want to look at it analytically. The margin of sampling error in a survey is dependent more than anything else on the sample size, on the number of interviews. So you get less variability, more consistent, more results, more greater statistical power, if you will, when you do a larger sample. Challenges, of course, it's expensive. So uh, it really depends um, how hard you want to hit your data and what you want to do analytically in terms of subgroups. So the margin of sampling error, it also is nice to say, settles down after about a thousand cases. You're, you get uh, sort of diminished returns as you increase the sample size from there. So you get plus or minus three and a half points typically when you include the design effect, which I won't talk about right now. But, uh, the, 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 uh, but let's say uh, it's really important to me to talk to, make sure I have uh, an analyzable subset of young adults in the sample or of some other population group that I really care about that may not be highly prevalent in the, in the state's population. Well, you might need to increase your sample size to get an adequate uh, representation of that group so you can analyze it with some confidence. So the, the size of your sample is, is dictated in large part by where you wanna go with it analytically. In an election poll too, don't forget, not everybody votes. So we start with a random sample of you know, uh, let's say a, a thousand Michiganders and 60% of them tell us they're going to vote, just for example. Now we're looking at uh, a likely voter population, not of a thousand, but of about 600, mm. right? So again, yeah. where do we want to go? And now I've got my 600 and now I want to look at it by racial and ethnic uh, subgroups or age groups. And I may now not have enough sample left because a lot of the likely voters, a lot of the, the registered or a lot of the population are not registered or are not likely to vote. So as you drill down into your sample, the sample sizes get smaller. There's less you can go uh, do with it analytically. The hmm. bigger the sample, the better. Just takes more effort, more time and more money to get it. Hmm. So when you were talking, you were talking in your introduction about would-be voters. So these days, lots of states, including Michigan, allow citizens to register to vote up to and including the day of the election. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, how, how do you account for those voters who register late in the game? Are there, could there, could that be significant or does that matter at all in, right. in yeah, the sure. election polling? Sure it matters. And that's one reason why um, a lot of polls restrict themselves to, I just want to talk to registered voters. But we ourselves tend to include the, the general public as well as registered voters because there's time for folks to register in many cases right up to the end. Of course, fewer and fewer people register. If, if it gets close to election day and you aren't registered by then, even if you have walk-in registration, not a lot of people do it, but it's best to include them. This is one reason why we certainly ask people if they're registered. We also try to do our final pre-election polling, which is the only one that should be regarded as predictive in any, in any way, as close to election day as possible. So if somebody did a poll two weeks out from an election or, or more and try to identify people who are registered and likely to vote, there could be changes in the last few weeks that they're not going to capture. Yeah. And that's why I would suggest those polls not be uh, held to account for uh, nailing the election result. They're conducted too far off. Isn't there actually a famous story about uh, George Gallup and the Dewey Truman election where they thought the election was so assured for Dewey that they stopped uh, doing polling in the last two weeks before the election? And that's what accounted for that famous headline that Dewey, Tr Dewey defeated Truman when in fact he didn't. 1948. That's right. right. Exactly right. And the lesson learned there is if you want... Uh, uh, a good prediction of the final outcome, you have to pull right up to the end. I would suggest, though, as I did in my presentation, that that really, though, shouldn't be the end game. Mm -hmm. the, this prediction of an election, uh, it's a neat trick if you pull it off. It's hard to do, but it's not, in my view, the true value that polling brings to the table. Mm -hmm. What we can bring to the table is an understanding of who's showing up and how they're voting and why. And that really is about 
what the election means, what we can learn from it, what the takeaway is for our communities and, and our country. Uh, I think that's a much higher value that we bring to the table than this trick of saying who's going to win before they do. So I want to ask you one more question before we turn to Tim, and it's it's the question about um, whether or not we, we all went through the census um, in 2020. It recalibrated congressional districts across the country, uh, had a, actually a huge impact here in Michigan, where you know where we lost a congressional district and all the other districts changed. Does that make does that um, census data that change like that does that make any difference in pre-election polling how you do your work or in the results that we see it really doesn't in in a in a statewide survey or in a, in a national survey uh, it, it it is a challenge in any case to do congressional district surveys because the basis for our sample frame let's say is telephone numbers which are not contiguous with congressional districts by any means and you can ask people what congressional district they live in but a lot of people don't really know. A lot of surveys, uh, pre-election surveys these days, I didn't mention another way of doing them is using uh, registered voter lists. You go to your state and you get a list of everyone who's registered to vote in the country and you use that for your sample. Now you've got their address and you can figure, it out, figure out their CDs yourself. The problem with this approach is that a lot of people who are, who are on the registered voter list haven't given the state their phone number. They're not required to do so. So there are companies that try to match the names and addresses with phone numbers. They get a lot of people who they can't match and they get a lot of bad matches. And you can end up with non-coverage, that is people who are listed but you don't have numbers for, easily of 40% or so. And that's highly problematic in terms of sampling. It's a pretty risky way to go. Hmm, very interesting. We're gonna shift, uh, we're gonna bring Tim into this a little bit. Um, so Tim Kiska has been the point person who makes the call on the winner of an election many times over the years. Uh, I think he's made the election night calls at the free press, if I'm correct, since 1974 and more recently at Channel 7. So, Tim, I don't see you on the screen yet. Um, I hope you're out there someplace. Uh, there you go. OK, so tell us what happens in the newsroom on election night and how you actually get to the point of making that decision announcement. Okay, normally, now things have changed because we've got more early, you know, early voting here in, in Michigan. But the idea would be, Gary, you know, explained very well about random sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, I would do, I think there, I can't remember the exact number, 5,000 precincts roughly in the state of Michigan. And what you do is every, every precinct's got a chance of being picked. And you sample, I try to get 80. So I'll pick 80 uh, just randomly mathematically uh and at the end you've got a mix of precincts uh sometimes people say well you are you looking for precincts that al always vote in line with the way the state votes the answer is no not at all uh what i do is i want to make sure that every precinct's got a chance of being picked come up with a list of 80 and this would be everything from the city's east side here in detroit up to i've had uh uh, precincts up in Ironwood, which is far western part of the UP, actually in another time zone. And what we would normally do is, if you take that 80, it's a pretty nice picture of the state of Michigan. And I would send people out to all of these 80 precincts that get there right before eight o'clock, hang around. Uh, and when the numbers became available at the precinct, they'd call and we'd feed it into a database and kind of measure okay, what's going on? Uh, who's winning here? Are there, are there any surprises? Um, and um, that, that's what we do. Exit polling, we do roughly the same thing with exit polling. Uh, we get a, I get a sample of 80 precincts and I send people out at the, they get there at seven in the morning. Um, work, we, I don't know what ABC does, but we have them from seven to 10, then again from about three to six. And they stand outside of the precinct and hand people surveys. And uh, people are generally pretty good about filling out these surveys. Um, not always, but uh, that's when you start digging down into the stuff that I think, think of these in two levels. Number one, news organizations, they'd like to be, they, first of all, they want to be right. So that's the key. They, because I think, I don't know, Gary can talk about this a little bit, but man, if you got something wrong, um, I've, I've been involved in situations where people have been fired at midnight on election night, fired, just boom, 
done. Um, you want to be right, uh, but you also want to be, if you can, be first. Mm -hmm. Don't know how it works at ABC News, but if ABC is sitting there and, uh, and NBC calls uh, Ohio for, uh, for whomever, I think there's some pressure there at that <laughs> point. Um, but so, here's what the networks do. Um, they'll have people exit polling, but then they've also got people who they hire, uh, Gary might know about this, tons of honest to God, genius nerd political scientists. And they're in there and they're watching not only that they're looking at the exit poll numbers, but they're monitoring the honest to God night of voting numbers as well. And they make an, an analysis for that as well. So you've got, usually I'm, each state's got a decision desk. I don't know how many people they've got mm -hmm. for each state, but there might be three or four. So they're looking at exit polling stuff. They're looking at the raw numbers as they come in. Um, they're looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. And it's only then that they uh, pull a pin, as it were. And that's the way it works. Um, like I said, you want to be there's the editors always say, well, well, you know, we first, that's not really important. You want to be right. Actually, <laughs> no, I think they want to be first too. Yeah. And, and so there is that pressure as as well. But that's what it, it's terror because if you're wrong, it's a terrible embarrassment to your your news organization terrible and like i said people get fired routinely um uh so it's yeah. Yeah. that's the, there's a pressure there so there's a great story there's a couple of great local stories about uh calling the election on election night and one of the one of the best is about the 2005 election for detroit mayor when that was the election when um, between kwame kilpatrick and freeman hendrix and as i recall the polls we're anticipating that Freeman Hendricks was going to win handily. Good I think time. it was like a like a 20%, 20 percent, 20 point lead is what they gave him. Yep. And that that would prevent Kilpatrick, who was at that time under investigation, would prevent him from winning a second term. That's not exactly what happened. So can you tell us, tell us, I think people would be really interested in the story of what happened that night. Well, what happened is, okay, I was or I was at WWJ Radio, the all-news radio station, and we were partnered with WJBK, Channel 2. Um, channels 4 and 7 hired two very competent pollsters. They didn't send anybody out in the field, but they did a massive telephone survey of Detroit and came back with Freeman Hendricks winning. Now, let me do the spoiler alert. Uh, 2005, um, what we later found out at that time, there were a lot of people that had cell phones, but in particular, the younger population in Detroit particularly had a whole bunch of burner phones and they weren't being reached. So what four and seven were coming up with was the older voters who tended to vote for Freeman. So they went on the air at eight o'clock at night, right after the polls closed and said the new winner is Freeman Hendricks. I did something different. I sent people into 30 precincts across the state or across, across the city, and they called, and I came up with an, an entirely different answer, which is Kilpatrick. So somebody is going to be wrong there. Me, which I would have been fired. Uh, in fact, I, uh, or the guys from Channel 4 and 7, and I remember seeing a, somebody put a blog post out there saying, uh, Kisk is either a genius or he's either going to be unemployed uh, pretty soon. We went on the air, we had a meeting over the phone and um, we could have sat on it, but my, I said, look, man, I'll, I'll resign if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. So the general manager said, go nuts. Uh, so we went on the air at nine o'clock, said the other guys were wrong. And uh, I mean, terror and chaos in the newsroom. I remember getting a call from the free press because I think they were ready to go with a Freeman Hendricks headline. And I think the editor said, names changed to protect the guilty. Kiska, <laughs> you're wrong. Sorry about my language on this, but we're going to tear you such a big asshole tomorrow in the paper. And I'll be leading the charge. Uh, and th that was sort of what I was up against. Uh, 
you know, people are going, what? You know, um, so that's that's what happened. And, and within 24 hours, I got, or 48 hours, I got like four job offers. Channel mm -hmm. four was already insisting that wanted to hire me the next day, the next day. So that's kind of what it happens. And everybody knows that going in, mm -hmm. you know, that if you're wrong, what happens? It's sort of like, well, I played Russian roulette, but I was only wrong once. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah right. Uh, exactly. So that's kind of what goes on. Uh, you tend to be very, nobody wants to play cowboy on election night. Nobody yeah. wants to play the hero, or at least nobody with any brains um, yeah. that I've ever met. So. And then if you fast forward, there's a, kind of the flip reverse of that story, that success in 2016, yeah. which was the uh, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump competition in Detroit Air in Michigan. Um, the pre-election poll suggested that Clinton was going to win. I don't think it was a big margin of victory. It was a few points, but again, that's not exactly what happened. So what, how, and, and lots of people made mistakes that night. So what, what explains the, what went wrong then? For me, okay, it was the only one I, I had Hillary winning the state and we went on the air, uh, or put, you know, put it out and retracted it about two hours later. But the short version was, um, had people in 80 precincts and I had all but 10 in. And the way I was reading these numbers is that I was working with a political scientist, a, a PhD guy, who says if these 10 behaved like they have in the past, Hillary's going to win by three points. Um, these 10 are still outstanding though. And I didn't quite grasp, they were all north and west of Lansing. And I started seeing these last 10 come in and they weren't performing as they had in the past. They were, the turnout for Trump was enormous. Um, and so we were, I was wrong. I was flat out wrong. Uh, like I said, we retracted it within a couple hours. Um, I think the only reason I didn't have my reputation, which is built since 74, totally destroyed is nobody was, hardly anybody got that one right. Yeah. Uh, so, but back to kind of what Gary was saying, the, the key to exit polling is, okay, what are we talking about in this election? I think a lot of people are talking about, will Roe versus Wade have an impact? So the first number I'd be looking at is these numbers, came, the exit poll numbers came in, how are women voting? Um, in particular, was there, did that swing the pendulum in any way? Uh, you start looking for, uh, I'd, I'd be looking at religion, we, ask, we usually ask religion, and I'd be asking, you know, if, if uh, sometimes we would ask, by the way, if you had a born again experience, uh, we've had that on the exit poll before, and that mm -hmm. sort of yielded some stuff. Uh, we only use that on occasion, um, but it's, it's not a game for amateurs, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm curious, I'd love to hear the two of you, both of you talk about, um, you know, do you, like what, how much trust should we place in polls? And how much, how much value do you think there is? And what kind of, what kind of job do you, the two of you think the media is doing in, in sharing the results of these polls? Gary, I mean, or, or I, I can talk, you know, for a second, you know, it depends on who's doing the polling. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think Gary mentioned this. There are some people, I mean, ABC and their work has been exemplary and this has been going on for decades. You know, it's it's got a tradition of doing that thing. But I've known people who I get calls from time to time from people who, you know, think, oh, I think I can do that. All you have to do is get one of those robocall machines. And I, I remember one guy, you know, getting one of these things and he wanted some help. But I'm, I knew this guy. I'm thinking I was amazed. I wouldn't have given him electricity, much less to allow him behind a, one of these machines. So there are a lot, I, I don't know if Gary's finding a lot more amateurs trying to get into the game, um, but you know, it's how much do you trust these things? Depends on who's doing it. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Nate Silver in 538.com grades the pollsters. You can look at that right. um, as well, but it depends on who's, who's doing it. And there are a lot of other questions you start asking. What was the time frame? Did they do this over a month? Or did they do this over a week? As Gary was talking about, what what was their? How did they do this? Did they do it over the phones? Did they do it via the email? How big was the sample size? Um, 
all of that stuff. And how was that sample size random? So I, most good pollsters pay attention to all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. The bad ones don't, yeah. and that's why they're bad. So, Here. Gary, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I would add that asking if you can trust the polls is like asking if you can trust the news. When in fact, there are many hundreds of news sources. There's reputable news organizations and there's dis disreputable ones. Uh, some are a little more than a platform on the internet for uh, uh, people who have a, a point of view to promote. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not whether you can trust the polls, but how do you know which polls to trust? I do have a little challenge about going with reputation. I think it's a, not a bad place to start. But there can be organizations that have a policy preference related to the outcome of a survey they might have sponsored that may color the way they do the survey, but also may not. There are a lot of organizations, including ones with a policy preference or agenda, who understand that independent research is terribly important, particularly for important issues, and who will actually sponsor and conduct truly independent research into their topic. Well, how do we tell? We tell through, again, disclosure. Transparency is, is essential. Uh, and, that, and in that, as I said previously, we need a detailed statement of the survey methodology so we can see if the sampling is or isn't reliable. We need to see every question that was asked and the, at least the overall results to that question so we can compare it to the analytical product and see if it made sense. Now, what I'm describing might sound like work. Well, it is. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge particularly for uh, reporters who really just want to slap a number in their story and move on. And uh, training and encouraging reporters about the risks and dangers has been a little bit of a lifelong pursuit for me, and it needs a, it still needs effort. News organizations need standard, reporters needs training. But in the meantime, we as news consumers also have to educate ourselves. It isn't all just numbers and percentage signs that have equal value and equal weight and equal credence. And we have to pick them apart and educate ourselves about which are and aren't reliable. Right. I mean, we, we ultimately all are relying on the media to translate those poll results for us because most of us aren't going to, say, Langer Research website to get the actual raw data. We're waiting for a newspaper to interpret it for us and present it for us. So we're, we're, we really are reliant on the media doing their job well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that's probably not a great idea. News organizations have, and, and reporters have, for far too long have indulged themselves in the lazy luxury of being both data hungry and math phobic. Mm -hmm. they, they want numbers to populate their stories to lend them some credibility. It really is just all a bunch of anecdote without some data behind it. Uh, and they don't do many, most don't do due diligence, don't have high standards, don't have expressed standards at all. If any of Buddy, watching this, you, you, you've got a contact at your local news outlet, drop them a line and ask, what are your polling standards? Have you published those? What sort of survey research do you and do you not report and why? Every news organization needs to develop, enunciate, and prepare to defend those standards. I wouldn't presume to set them for others, but I would suggest that everybody needs them. In the, in the meantime, relying on news organizations as our gatekeepers for good data is really not a safe way to go because they fail pretty miserably in that task, to be honest. So, I, Tim, do you happen to know whether the local newspapers and the local media organizations, whether they, in fact, have standards of the sort that Gary's talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. I don't know how much of them they publish. I know that the New York Times has a, an enormous box yeah, every story that's every polling story that says this is what we do. But yeah, they've got standards. They're pretty careful. They they end up uh, most of them hire uh, Bernie Porn does a lot of stuff for the Democratic Party, um, does a lot of stuff for the free press in a lot of places. But he's he's been doing this for since forever, and he's got a track record. Um, and and so yeah, they. They're quite careful. They're spending a lot. Money is not exactly flowing like crazy at places like the free press and the news. So whatever they do spend, they tend to be very careful and, and insistent that it's that it's right. So, so I'm going to pull a couple of the questions that have come in from uh, some listeners here. The first is that there's a lot of speculation that Republicans 
aren't honestly responding to questions from pollsters. Gary, do you have any way of knowing if that's true? Do we do we know more broadly that we're getting, how do you know you're getting an honest answer from respondents? Well, look, it, it, first of all, it, it's a lot of trouble to prevaricate or lie about your attitudes. If you're inclined to do that, you're really just not going to participate in the survey. But you know, people who have different political views tend to think that people with those with opposite opinions of their own, of their own are somehow ashamed of them or unwilling to express them or to be forthright about them. We find quite the opposite. We find that people who hold very liberal views and people who hold uh, very conservative views are equally forthright in, in holding their attitudes and being willing to, to express them. Uh, and again, you can look at survey results. We've had very consistent uh, proportions of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Uh, slight changes. Is, oh, there's been some fascinating long-term trends, but it's really quite consistent. And we can look at survey results. Right now, going into these midterm elections, it is widely reported that Republicans have the advantage in vote preferences in many state races and for the House overall. And that's we know that through good polling. And it's not a terribly new phenomenon. Last November, a year ago, uh, we found the Republicans with their largest lead in House preferences, in, in, in vote preferences for the U.S. House, a year out from the election, the largest lead we'd found for the Republican Party in 40 years. That doesn't indicate to me that Republicans are hesitant to express their views. Okay. Um, I've also got a question here. Somebody's asking whether you've ever had a poll, whether you've seen a poll that has been seriously skewed, like deliberately skewed to get a result. Ah. All the time. <laughs> I, I, I've seen some. And usually you get these from the campaigns. Uh, I don't know what Gary sees, but the campaign will say, hey, we just did this poll. And then you kind of look at the numbers that, of course, are advantageous to the candidate they're pushing. And then you, then you ask, OK, how did you ask these questions? Uh, I remember we asking one guy, uh, OK, give me your questions. And he didn't mention that he left the candidate's main competitor off the poll. <laughs> Why? Uh, I don't know, but you, yeah, you see that from time to time. Hmm. You see it all the time. It's not just political organizations, but it certainly is political campaigns. But look, I don't think the, the National Rifle Association is our sponsor to survey on gun control that didn't find overwhelming opposition to it. I, I don't think that the National Association of Soup Kitchens, I'm making this up, had ever done a survey that found anything but widespread hunger in the country. Uh, there are many organizations that use polling as PR to promote their agenda or point of view, rather than to independently assess public attitudes and behavior. And we have to be on the look for it. How do we know? We look at what they asked. We look at the methods they use, and 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 we can see quite clearly if there's intentional uh, bias installed in it. Let me tell you a really quick story. I had a friend who was a field director, directed field work for one of the most prominent political pollsters of his time, some time ago this was, and they had a Senate candidate, and my friend came in with the data, and this prominent campaign strategist said, how are we doing? And my friend said, not good, we're down by 13. And if you think about it, this political strategist had a couple of interests. He wanted to know where the race stood so he could address it. He also needed numbers that he could show to the media to gain credibility for his candidate, that his candidate could show to funders to raise money for his campaign, that he could show to his candidate to keep him in the race. So my guy said, not good, we're down by 13. And the strategist, without looking up, said, make it six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in spite of all this, you still think that pre-election polling is providing a valuable service for uh, the public, as long as the public is being smart and savvy about how they consume that data. Is that fair? Well, I try to cover this in my last slide, Joan. If you think about it again, campaigns are going to do polling and use that information to try to manipulate the debate, the discussion, and the election. Interest groups uh, with a dog in the fight are going to use polling to try to influence the debate, to try to tell us what's important and what isn't, what really matters in terms of issues and preferences and priorities and attributes and all the rest. If we don't have good quality, 
the investment it takes in good quality independent polling will be defenseless against this manipulation. We need to know this independently to keep uh, the uh, those who would manipulate us with unreliable data at bay. I think that's a good place to end. So thank you both very much. I learned a lot and I sure enjoy hearing the two of you tell stories about uh, being out there in the field. So thanks so much for joining us tonight. And I'm going to turn this back over to Sue Acton. Thank you, Joan. And thank you, Gary Langer and Tim Kiska for a fascinating discussion and for your willingness to answer so many of our questions. This has obviously been a topic of great interest to our community, and your expertise is very much appreciated. I would also like to thank Joan Richards Richardson, Don Droz, and our Behind the Scenes Program Committee and production team for bringing you the presentation tonight. If any of our guests tonight would like to consider membership, in our league as a next step, you will find that information on lwvgrosspoint.org. Adding to that, I'd like to remind you of just two things. First, this program has been recorded and a link will be emailed to all attendees. By tomorrow, you will find it on our YouTube page with links to that page available on our League of Women Voters Gross Point website. If you enjoyed the program, please share these links with your friends. Second, we produce issue-oriented programming for the public nearly every month. You are invited now to mark your calendars to save the evening of December 7th. We will have an in-person presentation at the Gross Point Unitarian Church. It's a panel discussion entitled Private Wealth and Public Bodies. It will explore questions about the donations of private money to projects in our municipalities, school districts, and library districts. More details about that program will follow on our website and newsletter soon. Finally, thank you for listening and for your interest in polling and elections. Your questions help to make this a truly remarkable program. Remember to vote November 8th or by using your absentee ballot and drop boxes available at every city hall. Thank you and good night.